Hi, this is Saka Rahman from the OrthoClips podcast series. And today I am with Fernando Villa Hernandez, who is an assistant professor of clinical orthopedic surgery at the University of Miami. He's also chief medical officer for orthopedics at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami. And he is in both the orthopedic trauma and joint reconstructive divisions in their department. And today we're going to be talking about management of distal femoral fractures in the elderly. Hi, Nano. Thanks for joining me. Good morning, Sakib. Uh, it's a pleasant uh, 80 degree sunny day in Miami. <laughs> it's not too bad here in New Jersey either. Um, well, it's great talking to you. So uh, how did you get interested in this topic? Uh, I know it is of interest to you. Um, tell us a little mm -hmm. more about that. So uh, as you know, I'm, I'm a fellowship trained orthopedic trauma surgeon, right? Obviously you trained me. Um, when I came, I, I always thought that I was going to, uh, I would like to have a evolution into joint reconstruction. I thought it was going to be in the later stages of my career, but it actually, the opportunity came in within like three or four years of practice. And slowly I started doing, you know, primary cases, primary hips, primary knees. And then slowly I sort of worked my way into periprosthetic fractures and eventually, you know, I fixed some. Then I started revising some B2s. Then I did, you know, a proximal femur and B3s. And then slowly that kept evolving until I got to the point where I was doing full-blown hip and knee revisions in loose implants, infected implants. And in that evolution, there was one day where I had a periprosthetic fracture around the total knee, which was very comminuted. It had very little bone stock around the knee. And when I looked at my options for reconstruction and my options for uh, for fixation, obviously very limited bone around the knee. So we went and did a full revision to a distal femur. And I did a couple of those. And then one day uh, there was a, a young lady who was in her 80s, a very low demand uh, patient. Uh, she was pre, she had pre-dementia, and she had a very comminuted intraarticular C3 supracondylar fracture with very osteoporotic bone. And I had had a couple patients sort of like that that had failed their fixation. They had a lot of trouble walking. They had a lot of trouble getting out of the wheelchair. And it was actually my boss at the time, Greg Wright, who suggested, well, why don't you try a distal femur? And I looked into it, and technically I felt I could execute it. And we actually did the surgery. And uh, what was most surprising is when she came back on follow-up about two weeks later, this lady who had a really bad fracture and was in bed and I thought was never going to be able to get out of bed, actually came into my office walking with a walker and moving her, her knee from zero to 90. And that sort of opened, opened the gates of, of my interest in this. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's one of the arguments you hear a lot of uh, surgeons making uh, for choosing this procedure over, over uh, you know, osteosynthesis methods. So what would you say are the main considerations and priorities uh, for mm -hmm. the surgeon to kind of take into account? Like, you know, when you're thinking about the risks and benefits of fixation versus distal femoral replacement, what are okay. the key things that you teach your residents or go through your mind? So in my mind, the first, uh, the first thing that goes through my mind is obviously the patient. Uh, usually in terms of age, uh, anywhere between 75 to 80 or above, but you really got to look at it not from a chronological perspective, but more from a physiologic perspective. You know, you you, it's, it's an 85-year-old who walks, every, walks a mile every day and goes to the supermarket every other day. Or is this a 75-year-old that just basically lies at home, watches TV, lives with their family? You also have to look at comorbid conditions. Is this the patient that can stand surgery? Is it how much, you know, how how, how healthy is this patient? Is, has this patient obviously been medical op, medically optimized? Um, the other thing is, I mean, from a from a fracture perspective, you really got to look at how the quality of the bone, how osteoporotic is it? Does it have good? Does the bone have the ability to hold fixation does the bone have the ability to withstand portional and axial loads of the fixation and one of the most important factors for me in terms of the fracture itself is the intraarticular combination right it's uh, when you have you know very osteoporotic bone very weak bone and you have intraarticular combination whether it be on the sagittal plane or the coronal plane those those fractures are hard to fix 
I mean, even in young people, right? And in, and in older people, it's hard to physically capture the bone and, and bring it together. And then it's even harder to fix the bone. And then it's even harder to maintain the bone fix while you do the rest of the procedure. Um, you know, this, the, the, the way I, I started thinking about it is basically, you know, you take, for example, a, a femoral neck fracture and a displaced femoral neck fracture in a geriatric patient gets treated with an arthroplasty because of the high risk of non-union, because it gets patients up and walking faster, right? You take uh, a distal humerus fracture, a distal humerus fracture with intraarticular extension in an old patient with that's very low functional demand, one of, one of your reconstruction options is a total elbow, right? So I sort of, sort of went along that thought processes and then said, well, you know, if I have a very comminuted intraarticular fracture in a bone, a very osteoporotic bone in a low function elderly patient, I think perhaps, you know, uh, a distal femur might be a better option. That being said, there's also, you know, the consideration of, of recovery after surgery. You know, is this a patient that I want in a wheelchair for six weeks and then I want him partial weight bearing for another six weeks and then I want him, you know, weight bearing is tolerated and I haven't seen any healing and then there's a risk of reoperation, the risk of hardware failure. So, Along those lines, eventually, I got I, I, I sort of got interested in in just basically treating these fractures with an arthroplasty. Yeah, and you, you kind of answered a couple of uh, my other questions about you know what age activity level do you start to consider it? What um maybe let's uh, step over and uh, discuss what does the literature tell us? Have you told us some of your personal experience and how you evolved to coming to this. What does the data say about, especially specifically about, I guess, ORIF versus distal femoral replacement in the elderly? Do we have uh, any literature to uh, support either technique or what does it say? There is. There's, uh, I mean, most of the, of the literature on, on distal femoral replacement obviously comes from the oncology world. Um, the use of distal, distal femoral replacement actually uh, in terms of trauma most of the literature talks about its use in terms of non-union or failure of fixation. In terms of literature that talks about, you know, acute treatment of these injuries, there's not a lot of literature out there. There's a couple articles that have, you know, trials where they compared open reduction internal fixation with distal femur. They, they talk about just distal femur itself. Um, results are a little bit variable. Um, it's hard to come to any conclusion from, from the limited amount of data, but most of them talk about, you know, how these patients actually do functionally better and they're back to pre-injury level a little bit faster. Um, it would be interesting to see um, how much this, you know, if you compare a, a, an immediate distal femoral replacement to a delayed distal femoral replacement for a for a reconstruction for one for an ORIF that has failed, you know, um, perhaps also in terms of cost that would be interesting to look at. But in terms of the literature, the data is there's there's some data, but not a lot for me to stand here and categorically say that these fractures should be treated with a distal femur. Okay, fair enough. Um, so give me a, uh, maybe a case example, give me a representative case example, maybe somebody you've done recently or just something that, uh, you think is a good teaching case and take, walk us through, uh, after your indications, cause we talked about that. Tell us mm -hmm. about your approach to the case, uh, maybe some more specifics, um, just some tips for someone and, who's thinking about doing one of these. Uh, you know, first, first, obviously, you want to evaluate the patient, evaluate their functional level. In my hospital, these patients usually get admitted either to medicine or the trauma geriatric service. Um, they get medically evaluated, medically optimized. Um, you want to try to, the, I, I think along the lines of hip fractures, you know, you want to try to get these patients to the OR quickly. But then again, you know, if you are going to do a distal femur, then you have to call the implant company, make sure the implants are ready, make sure you have the correct implant, the correct side of, of, of implant. So it's a, it's a little bit of a bother. It's not like, you know, the, the cephalomedullary nail that you have in stock for the hip rock or the inner trope that came in the night before. Um, in terms of, uh, you, you, you want to try to deal also early on with, with 
family and, and patient expectations in terms of, you know, return to function, getting them up and walking. And I mean, this is relatively uh, big surgery and you want the patient and the family to know what they're getting into. Um, as far as technical tips, uh, I, use, I do these patients uh, obviously uh, in, in a supine position. I try to prep all the way up to the pelvis and use uh, a sterile tourniquet. Um, a midline approach into the knee is is the way, the way I go about it. Um, it's it's a little bit different than doing a primary total knee. You know, usually you have hematoma, you have contusion around the skin, so you, you got to be careful with the dissection, particularly when you make um, the flaps uh, around the knee. Uh, I do a traditional medial capitular arthrotomy. I, I go up the quadriceps and basically uh, that that exposes the fracture for you. Now, um, next step, uh, obviously, you, if there is comminution, the comminution will become very visible immediately. You start removing some of that bone. And then very carefully, subperiosteally, you start elevating uh, around the fracture itself and into the shaft of the femur. Now, the, the, one, of the real, one of the early headaches of this case, obviously, is when you're working posteriorly around the knee and around the femur, you want to you wanna stay away from, from the bundle and you want to protect it as much as possible. Um, in terms of the resection of the femur, uh, you got to be really well versed on, on the implant itself because these implants have a minimal length that they that they require. So you want to. Sometimes it's a question of you know resecting the femoral shaft, probably maybe just a little bit above the fracture, depending on the combination. If it's a fracture that just has a little bit of shaft extension, then then you really got to figure the math of what is the length of my implant and how much bone do I have to resect. Now, that being said, one of the ways you determine that is once you resected the femur, you can put the femur on the back table and try to put it back together as a puzzle and, uh, and measure the length. Um, then we, uh, I turn my attention to the tibia. We, we start uh, the tibia. Uh, I, I wean both the tibia and the femur at the same time. At this point, I've, I've taken down the tourniquet, make sure I have it hid that push your bundle. And I've taken down the tourniquet to provide, to avoid any, um, any heat injury to the bone while I am reaming. Um, we use the extra medullary guide for the tibia. We try to cut the tibia, as minimal tibia as we can. Uh, one of the things I like to do at this step is actually uh, identify uh, the meniscal line or the meniscal scar, because that's very critical in terms of determining um, the joint line. After that, you start, you start uh, building your femoral component. And I mean, obviously, once you've determined the size of your tibia and determined the diameter of the tibia itself, you start working on the femur. And in terms of the width of the femur, uh, in, in, in my hands, the smaller, the better. Once you've determined the width of the femur, then you start your building blocks in terms of how much, uh, how much of the distal femur is going to replace the shaft. One, one of the important concepts in, in this operation is the concept of, of modularity with, with these implants. It means that you can add you know, a, 10, a 10 centimeter block or a five centimeter block or so on and so forth. And then you can build up or build down depending on the length of bone that you need. Now, once you've determined how much bone more or less you need and what the tibial cut is like and what space you're gonna look at, what space you're gonna need, and then you start sort of trialing it, trialing it the, the important thing becomes the position of the femoral component, right? The, the position of the femoral component is very important because you've lost all landmarks to determine the external rotation of the femoral component. And you sort of try tweaking it, you know, one way or the other. And basically what you're looking at is one, the soft tissue tension, and two, how the patella tracks around, uh, around the implant itself. And that it comes a little bit, it becomes a little bit of, you know, trialing and erroring where you sort of, you know, let me try this length, let me try that length, let me try this rotation, that rotation, and see what works best. Once you've determined your length, once you've determined uh, the rotation of the femoral component, you sort of mark it on the bone. I usually use those, those little wedges where you build the modular block to determine my rotation. And then next step, obviously, is implantation. You want to you put bone plugs into the canals, you want to brush and... And, and clean the canals as much as possible with good cementing technique. And then, um, then you proceed on to implantation. There's, there's two ways of implanting it. Uh, you, you, can, you can implant the tibia first, hold it, and then implant the femur later. Um, I try to do everything as much as I can in one shot. If not, I'll stop. If, if there's any problem, I'll stop at the tibia and sort of reorganize and then do the femur. Um, 
the, uh, the, the one thing about the in particular implant that I use is I use a, a, a rotating platform implant, which means that the tibial base plate actually can rotate around where you, uh, where you have put your tibia. So that allows me a little bit of, of wiggle room in terms of the rotation of the femur. Um, in terms of post-operative care, these patients, uh, you want them walking and you want them up and moving as quickly as possible. Um, that is part of, of, of the reason that you did the surgery. Um, you want to obviously DVT prophylax with adequate pain management and get them, you know, up and walking as quickly as I can. Usually I see these patients back by the second week post-op and we'll take it from there. All right. A lot of uh, technical tips there um, mm -hmm. that I think our listeners could use. Um, I guess we'll wrap up. My last question uh, will be really on uh, maybe if you could identify a few key pitfalls uh, mm. that uh, surgeons sometimes experience and maybe opportunities for improvement um, as this technique evolves, you know, maybe with regard to surgical technique or implants or mm. I don't know if you think there's anything else on the horizon maybe that could improve mm. our outcomes with these. Uh, in terms of, of, of generally, right, in terms of management of these injuries, I think, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating that all patients be treated with, you know, all, all patients with supracondylar fractures uh, be treated with, with a distal femur. There's, there's a particular subset of patients that actually will do better. Do I think there's a possibility that eventually everybody might get treated, you know, all, pa all geriatric patients with supracondylar femurs? Maybe that 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 remains to be seen. Um, in terms of the technical stuff, I think uh, the length of the implant is important. The rotation of the femoral component is important. Where the patella tracks is important. The joint line is important. There's in, in terms of the implant themselves. There's really, especially from the oncology literature, there's there's no one implant that's superior to the other. Um, in terms of my personal preference, the, the, the rotating platform allows me some, some wiggle room in terms of the rotation. In terms of um, future uh, techniques, certainly I think, uh, you know, I think the, the, the implants now, you have, you have the modularity in terms of the stem, but the sizes are a little bit of a problem. I think there's not enough demand for this surgery that, you know, the implants may continue to evolve. Perhaps in the oncology world, they've, they've come up with some some other you know some improvements of the of the implants uh, themselves. But I think uh, this using a distal femur for a particular subset of patients is the best surgery. Yeah, I think you uh, definitely made that point, and I guess it really comes down to uh, patient selection. And I guess for this particularly knowing you know, mm -hmm. what your capabilities of a surgeon are. And I guess to some extent, you know, um, doing a lot of joints puts you in a position to uh, nope. uh -huh. eat that transition a little bit better. I mean, for, for my, for the other, the other part that I, I guess I should add is, I, I mean, I work at a super tertiary hospital and I work at an academic center, right? And I have trauma partners that have been in this for a while. And I have joints partners that have been at this for a longer time than I have. And I have oncology partners. We have a full-blown oncology department here at the University of Miami. So this was not something that, you know, sort of just I, I sort of did it on my own. Obviously, I, I, I used that resource of having oncology partners, and I, and I called them up and said, hey, you know, give me what your technical tips are, or should I look for this, or should I look for that? This is perhaps not something that should be done at the uh, community level, um, but Definitely, I had, I had in my particular case, I had resources available to me that made me feel much more comfortable in terms of, of, of doing these surgeries. Good points. Well, I think we're about out of time. Um, and I think that was a great podcast. Uh, just to recap, I've been chatting with uh, Dr. Fernando Vallejo Hernandez uh, from the University of Miami. We've been talking about management of distal femoral fractures in the elderly. Uh, Nano, it was a pleasure. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sakib. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me, and uh, I'm honored to be invited.